Hello everyone, welcome to Books and Booze. I'm Alex. This is a series where I review books and I review booze. This time I'll be going over a novel called After the Banquet by Yukio Mishima. I will also be sipping on a sake lager or a rice lager called Sun and Steel, which if you know anything about Mishima, he wrote a autobiographical, somewhat philosophical piece titled Sun and Steel, though the beer in question is a reference to the Iron Maiden song, which is in reference to traditional samurai code, which plays a lot with Mishima's ideas, which we'll get into during this video. And I already opened it, but let's give it another try. That might be from a failed recording attempt for this video. I really dig that. It's a lot more lighter than what I usually drink in terms of lagers, which I usually aim toward darker ones, but this one's kind of crisp and almost like citrusy in a way, so it's, uh, it's quite pleasant. But anyway, the book in question, After the Banquet, is a 1960 novel by Yukio Mishima, and it follows a character named Kazu, who is a middle-aged um, owner, proprietess of this upscale Japanese restaurant and lounge that mainly caters to politicians. During her time working here, she meets a semi-retired ambassador, claims he's retired, though he's kind of still interested in wheeling and dealing in politics, uh, and his name is Nagochi. She grows to like him over time, and they eventually marry, and then the novel from there explores these conflicts that rise up between the two as there's tensions in between the kind of political world and Kazu's formerly very well ordered life that she now misses and uh, Nagochi's integrity flares up and it gets into all kinds of interesting muddy waters between these two characters and their worlds. Now a little bit about the author himself if you are not aware. Yukio Mishima was an interesting character in his day. He wore many hats to begin with. He was a author, a poet, a playwright, an actor, a model, a Shintoist, a nationalist, and a founder of an unarmed civilian militia um, that translates into the SHIELD Society. Um, his work often fuses this very traditional kind of Japanese literature with more modern Western literary styles at the time. Uh, for example, I know he was a big fan of William Faulkner, and you can definitely see that in his work. And from my experiences, I often see him exploring tensions of generational change and death and mortality. And all those themes sort of just, just haunt him and they permeate throughout his work. Uh, kind of, I think in some degree, was kind of always reveling in despair in kind of this post-war Japanese context that you find him writing in most of the time. And the reason he's an interesting character is mainly his controversial political activities. From his mid-30s onward, uh, Mishima developed a very right-wing ideology, very nationalistic ideology, in which he was very proud of the traditional culture and spirit of Japan as Western influences were taking over in post-war Japan. He took very serious opposition against these things. He saw Western style and materialism alongside a lot of Japan's post-war democracy and globalism and communism influence um, worrying and ultimately worked to embrace ideas that Japanese people could not lose their national essence which is usually what he would toss around as kind of the traditional nationalistic attitude of Japan and because of that uh, in November of 1970, Mishima and four members of his militia, the Shield Society, um, actually entered a military base in central Tokyo. Um, they took all of the commanders hostage and they unsuccessfully kind of tried to inspire this coup in which Mishima gave this huge speech at the end of it. Um, saying they would kind of reclaim power to the emperor and the long live the emperor and all this jazz and he ultimately um, went through a samurai ritual, which I don't know if I'm allowed to say on YouTube or anything, where he essentially uh, unalifes himself at the end of it in public display after this failed coup. Most of all though, he knew how to write some uh, really great books. 
And that's more so where my interest of him comes into play, even though all that craziness and tension in his life comes out in all the works that he wrote. And he was absolutely prolific in his time where he wrote, um, I have the list right here, 34 novels, 50 plays, 25 books of short stories, uh, at least 35 books of essays, uh, one basically opera, and one movie. And we're talking about one of those novels today. So let's get into it. First and foremost, I like to cover things that maybe I didn't care about a book before uh, going into all the things that I really, really liked about this book. This is kind of a qualm I have with Mishima's writing in general, even though I get that it's coming a lot of times from his uh, Japanese tradition, is just the details become so much at times where it becomes exhaustive getting through certain paragraphs. And I get that they reveal a lot about certain characters. For example, you'll get a lot of details, <laughs> excruciating details about the way that Kazu had her life set in order um, down to like minute details about like table setting and things like that. And that's just to juxtapose later on when she is not able to order these very specific details in her life and you can kind of see upheaval um, occurring in that way. And similarly in the same way, when you get more into Noguchi's life and his day-to-day -day task, you get the same amount of excruciating details where it's like, I get it, I get that this is very revealing and it builds atmosphere around these characters, but sometimes you're just wishing it would roll through. Other than that, that's kind of my only complaint with After the Banquet specifically, even though that is a characteristic of Mishima's writing in general. So, what did I like about this novel? Well, I think the two, there are two conflicts that I find very, very interesting and just were actually honestly exhilarating in a way to read in this book that I wouldn't have expected them to be. And one of those conflicts is around Kazu, a woman who is perpetually obsessed with her place in the universe and her place in time and eternity. Kazu is obsessed, routinely obsessed with being noticed in some way and more specifically being noticed in some way that is lasting. This is most apparent in her obsession over Nagochi's family burial plot um, that shows up repeatedly throughout the novel as kind of this thing in the background of her mind and it's actually this, this major spark for her desire to get married to him. As an example, here's how one of the ways that Kazu sees Nagochi's burial plot. The tomb, though not the imposing monument Kazu had envisioned, was a gray stone carved with the family crest and showed something of the ancient lineage and pride of an illustrious family. family. Kazu was genuinely fond of such things. From stone to stone could be traced the genealogy utterly untainted by fakery and a splendid line of people. Kazu now belonged to the same family as these people, and she would someday be buried in their family temple, and to think that she would dissolve into one stream with them, never to separate, what a source of comfort that was, and what a priceless trick on society. And you get more and more of her obsession with things that are lasting in a way that's not as, uh, as morbid. I think she's always kind of fighting this idea that that's going to be the most memorable way she can last is in her grave and a beautiful grave that's serene and things like that but you also see this coming to fruition later in the novel as she wedges her way into involvement in a political campaign where she believes kind of political action can become this lasting thing one of the more intriguing occurrences to me uh happens at one point where she has a disappointment or perhaps even you could describe it as sorrow over the fact that this thief that broke into her, her lodge and restaurant did not attack her or do anything to her, but that he was right next to her room scanning the scene, but nothing ended up happening. And she was very upset that basically no misfortune fell on her because she was not noticed even in a way that would bring misfortune into her life. Um, and that was probably one of the more striking scenes with conflict that goes on with this character it's just fascinating to read about and honestly all those are just a few of the examples that lead Kazu's journey into trying to find some way to be immortal in her own eyes sort of riveting to read despite the fact that you would find it in kind of this more mundane or drab setting 
And that transitions into what's the other really interesting conflict in this novel and probably a little bit revealing of a uh, Mishima's nationalistic ideas coming through in one of his texts. And that's that the political powers at B seem to hold a much greater influence than we actually give them credit for. And specifically, it's quite clear in this novel that it's Western uh, political ideologies. In short, Mishima declares in this novel, through just how it pans out, that Western politics is all a facade. You see Kazu take on these grassroots efforts um, that are like really inspirational and these incredible speeches she gives to the people of Japan to, as a light spoiler, not really any of Vel in her life. And this makes the character of Nagochi all the more interesting to me because during this conflict, he doesn't seem to be all that interested in being in politics again. In one way, he's just kind of floating through it. It's pretty, it's established pretty early on in the novel, so it's not that big of a spoiler that he's not super interested in getting back into politics. He's, he likes being retired, he likes being on the edge. Um, it's not really until younger party members come into play and they start influencing him, especially around the same time of his wedding with Kazu, as it sparks this big publicity around him again, that he's sort of pushed back into that political sphere. And that's also juxtaposed with the influence of Kazu, who, obsessed with some way of being remembered, wants her husband to step back into politics and try to do and accomplish these great things in the political sphere, so that she inadvertently is also remembered in some way. And this also has just another jab on the way that Mishima writes about Western politics, especially about Noguchi, because from what I recall, all discussions are just about how they can possibly win the election. There's never actually anything stated about like what Noguchi and his party are going to do if they win. And even when he's giving speeches, you just know he gives a really good speech. You don't actually know the content of the speech. You just know it's really eloquent and people are really moved by it. Both of these conflicts come to resemble one of the central themes in the novel. And that's the idea that there's a cyclical nature to human folly in some way, and that younger generations are constantly stepping into the fold, unknowing about what they're really getting into and just kind of uplifting similar things, but pushing them into greater extremes uh, more and more. And that is made manifest here in terms of politics. To quote the novel early on, uh, actually, I think even near the first or second chapter we're in here. Anyone, however modern he fancied himself, be an exception to rules of passion which have existed from remote antiquity. The young people these days, Kazu would often remark, are doing exactly what young people have always done, only the clothes are different. Young people get the foolish idea that what is new for them must be new for everyone else too. No matter how unconventional they get, they're just repeating what others before them have done. The only difference is that society doesn't make as much fuss about their antics as it used to, and the young people have to go bigger and bigger extremes in order to attract attention. There was nothing new or startling about this pronouncement, but coming from Kazu, it had authority. So do I give After the Banquet by Yukio Mishima a toast for excellence? Uh, absolutely. This was probably one of my more favorite of his works that I've come across. Uh, I think I may believe read roughly five of his books at this point, and I've barely heard anything about this one. And I, I kind of think it's a hidden gem of his work that I've seen so far. Most people get caught up on his Sea of Fertility series, which he wrote leading up to his coup that was kind of planned, or what I do think is still probably one of his greatest, which is the sailor who fell from grace with the sea. But this is absolutely a hidden gem. If you're able to find this, pick it up. It's a fairly light read. It's fairly short. If you're like me, you'll kind of just be captivated primarily by Kazu's struggle in order to find immortality in a way that it feels like she's always on the cusp of understanding belonging and just well-being in her life. But 
there's still some greater influence at play where she's never satisfied and sort of wallows in that despair in a similar way that I think uh, Mishima had throughout his life dealing with a very similar tension um, himself that you see come to very destructive conclusions and, and sad conclusions in his life. I won't spoil anything about the novel because I'll encourage you to go read it, but you can probably guess it's, it's a little bit bleak uh, in the end. But the prose, as always, absolutely beautiful. The characters, as complicated as I've seen him write his characters to be, absolutely a toast of excellence. So cheers to Yukio Mishima for After the Banquet. Thank you so much for watching this all the way to the end, uh, if you have. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you go and search out this wonderful novel. Uh, if you like uh, in-depth book reviews like this, then please subscribe uh, to this channel. If you are into Yukio Mishima, if you're, or if you're not, if you've read this and you have some different takeaways from it, please let me know in the comments below and we'll start a discussion around it. I also do uh, video essays on this channel, so if analytical video essays about cultural products, mainly movies, are of interest to you, then also check those out. So until then, cheers.